This is Britain's best-known fighter aircraft, the Spitfire. We Americans in Britain know the Spitfire. We've seen it in action. Many of us have flown it in action. Believe me, the Spitfire has got what it takes. The Spitfire was a wonderful aircraft for maneuverability. The first Spitfire I flew at Dunkirk was, I think, a thousand horsepower. So you all had this knowing that you might go up and knock them back. Sea fires were hitting the enemy from the sea. Spitfire. 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 Spitfire pilots. The Spitfire. Yo, that intro was freaking sick. Hey guys, welcome to JT Engineering. In this video, we're going to be 3D printing, building, painting, and doing a flight test on the 3D lab print 1.7 meter Spitfire. This is a plane that I've been wanting to build for quite a while now. When I was a kid, and still to this day, the Spitfire is my favorite airplane. I think it's cooler than the B-51. You can fight me about it in the comments section below. In this video, we're going to be 3D printing, building, painting, and doing a test flight of this aircraft. This has really been kind of a pain in the ass to put together. The 3D printing process wasn't the easiest, and I'm not really great at painting, but I gotta say that she flies beautifully, and I'm actually very happy with the way that this plane turned out. Why don't we go get building, and if you don't care about the build process, feel free to skip forward to the test flight using the slider below. Let's get building. Printing the parts for this plane was an absolute nightmare. I could never get the parts to slice properly in the software, and I had a ton of issues getting the parts to print correctly, so it was a total pain in the ass. Eventually, I had enough printed parts to start assembling the wing. Each wing is made of nine parts and is built in three sections. First, I assembled the two wing root sections and glued them together. After that, I glued the other two sections to the wing root, and now it was time to glue the aileron together. These ailerons have a printed hinge pin that slides into the wing tip and also into the inner wing section so you can't fully assemble the wing until the aileron is installed. When the glue is set, I was able to install the aileron and glue up the wing tip. To finish up the wing you just repeat these steps for the other side. Here's where things get a little bit dicey. There are no carbon spars that run down the center of these wings, so the only thing that's holding these two wing halves together is the ungodly amount of super glue that I had to use. I would be blatantly lying to you if I didn't mention I was worried about the strength of this wing. Having 3D printed another airplane from these designers and having the wing fail on the maiden flight, I am a bit worried to say the least. Oh yeah. Ah! <laughs> the wing broke in half. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But this wing is massive. At 67 inch wingspan, gluing these two sections together was rather difficult. I used a bunch of packing tape to hold everything together as the glue set. While that glue was drying though, I was able to install the split flaps. These are built in the same style as the ailerons, but the flaps are flexible enough where you can bend them and install them after the wing is complete. When the glue had dried, I could move on to painting. I gave the whole surface a good sand just to knock off any major imperfections. I started by putting down a base coat of gray on the bottom of the wing. The warbirds typically use this color as camouflage. This wing is going to get black and white stripes near the wing root. For this, I masked off the wing and put a base coat of white down, and then I used tape to cover where I wanted the white stripes to remain, and then sprayed black over the top of it and removed the tape. At this point, it was time to start on the fuselage. Gluing all those pieces together is nothing spectacular, but the tail of the aircraft is a little bit tricky to get right. First, I glued all the control surfaces together. I used my flat shop table to make sure while the glue set, the pieces stayed aligned and as flat as possible. Getting the vertical and horizontal stabilizer installed is super annoying. This model utilizes 3D control rod tubes that are built into the prints of the fuselage. What this means is if you don't perfectly glue your fuselage sections together or your prints aren't perfect, your control rods won't go all the way through the printed tube. As this was the case with my plane. To fix this, I heated up the end of the control rod with a lighter and pushed it through the tubes to clear any problem areas. That seemed to work okay. The control horns are also printed on the elevator and rudder, and since you have to install the elevator and horizontal stabilizer as one piece, you have to hook up the control rod first and then glue everything in place. So considering the rod tubes problem and this finicky step, assembling the tail is a pain in the ass. The rudder and the vertical stabilizer gets assembled in the same way. Once that was finished, I was able to install the servos. I cut out the section of the fuselage left over from printing with the soldering iron, revealing the spots for the servos to be installed. I screwed in the servos and made sure to use an adjustable control rod adapter since the ends of the rods connected to the control surfaces are not adjustable. Once all the linkages were hooked up, I hit my first major milestone on this project and was able to do a flight control check for the first time. Once that was complete, I decided to get to work camouflaging the rest of the plane. 
For this, I used an airbrush, and I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not artistic, like, at all. And I had no idea how to use an airbrush, so I had to watch some YouTube videos. After getting my master's degree from YouTube University in airbrushing, I was finally ready to give this a try. As I said before, I'm not very artistic, so getting the color I was shooting for took me a few tries. I'm not very good at color matching, and I have no idea how to mix colors, but in the end, I ended up getting something that worked, though I did have to repaint the camouflage spots a couple times. The leading edge wingtips on some Spitfires had a yellow accent to help prevent friendly fire. For this, I just brushed on some yellow paint. With the wing paint mostly done, I decided to finish the fuselage paint. To start, I did a little bit of masking and painted the bottom portion of the fuselage the same gray color I did with the bottom of the wings. When that had dried, I could start working on the invasion stripes on the fuselage. I did this the same way as the wing. I started with a white base coat. The only difference is the tail has a moss green stripe around it at the very far back. So I painted that first and then masked off and painted the black portion of the invasion stripes. While that was drying, I decided to install the electronics in the wing. I first installed the aileron servos. This was pretty straightforward. The flaps, however, were super annoying. The flap servo drives the control rod through a portion of the wing rather than over the top like the ailerons do. This means you have to put the rod in, install the end of the flap control horn, and then maneuver the Z-Bend through the servo horn. Neither of these sides are adjustable, so I just got it close enough and then used my receiver to program the up and down limits. It was a bit fiddly, but in the end it worked okay. The last electronics to install on the wing were the retractable landing gear. This is fairly straightforward, it's just four screws for each retract, run the wires, and it was pretty much done. With the wing finished up and the paint dry, I could finally install this beast of a motor. I used the supplied metal motor mount and just put some super glue on the screws to keep them from coming loose in the fuselage. I then mounted the motor to the mount using the supplied screws with some Loctite on them. With the motor and all the other electronics in, I could glue in all the small detail parts. I waited to do this after I was done with most of the fuselage. I find I break a lot of parts when I'm working on things and handling them, so waiting till the very end to apply the fragile detail stuff is a really good idea. At this point, we are nearing the end of this build, but we're missing the most important part, the decals. As usual, I ordered my decals from Cali Graphics. I've always had amazing results with these and would highly recommend them. All of the builds on my channel, I've used Cali Graphics decals. I'm a huge fan. The link to their website is in the description of this video. Applying the decals is always my favorite part of any project. It means you're really close to the end of the build, and this is the step where you finally see the plane come to life and start looking something like the prototype. After that, this plane was basically done. Off camera, I did a little bit of weathering. The plane looked more like a toy before I weathered it, and I added the detail just to make it look more like a real thing. After it was completely done with the finish work, I did a couple coats of matte clear coat over the entire plane. I find that this really helps keep the decals from coming up and adds another layer of protection. With the plane built, she's finally ready for her time in the spotlight. In the design of the Spitfire, which is a real beautiful thing to fly, the first Spitfire I flew at Dunkirk was, I think, a thousand horsepower, or maybe a thousand two. And the final one was in the same airframe, was two thousand four hundred horsepower. I wanted to be in a Spitfire where I, I could fling it around and, and uh, combat with, with the enemy aircraft. The thing about the Spitfire that was so useful in combat was its maneuverability. If we hadn't had the Spitfire during 1940, uh, then I think it would have been very, very bad. I, in fact, I think we'd have lost the war. I'm sure we would. You will not find a Spitfire pilot can criticize in any shape or form the Spitfire. I've never met one. She really was the perfect flying machine. All right, we are here at the Walsberg Model Airport to test out our 1.7 meter 3D printed 3D lab print Spitfire. The winds today are absolutely beautiful. It's calm winds, so we're going to get a battery put in her, and let's just hope that it comes back in one piece and we don't spread microplastics all the way down the runway. So we'll get a battery in it, and we'll get it up in the air. As always on the taxi out, I'm doing a flight control check to make sure all my control services are moving correctly. I'm also praying to the gods of model aviation that my plane comes back in one piece. On maiden flights, you never really know what's going to happen. Getting ready for takeoff. I'm a little bit worried about the strength of the wing. A little bit worried about the strength of the tail, but all that's left to do is to send it. And she's up. Gears up. 
How was that, DJ? That was really shitty flying on my part. I'm gonna really limbo this. I'm gonna see how close I can get to being on the deck. I spent the next few minutes flying this plane around and getting to know how she flies. At first, I wasn't pushing her too hard since I was a little bit worried about the strength of her wing, but after a bit, I was comfortable in giving her about all that she had. This plane is an absolute fucking riot to fly. It's not super fast, but it's extremely agile, and it's honestly probably the best plane I have in my fleet. It's fun, it's light, it's floaty, and it's sexy as hell. This plane went from being the bane of my existence to one of my new favorite things. Rudder control on this plane is definitely not optional. With that big ass motor and a 15 inch prop, if you slam the throttle forward, she will definitely bite you. I'm pretty sure that's what happened in this clip. Holy shit! Did you see that? I hit grass over there, okay. Cody saw that. I fucking thought this plane was done. After that maneuver, I decided to take it a little bit more easy. I'm not exactly a Top Gun ace, and I am very lucky that that plane actually came back. I was just about to the end of the battery life, and we were just gonna kinda fly around and get some more drone shots, and then I kind of ruined the afternoon. Oh, shit! <laughs> I'm so sorry. Hold on! Okay, I'm gonna bring it in for a landing. Because I lost part of my wingtip. Oh wow, she is not happy. Holy shit, dude! My aileron's hanging off the plane! <laughs> Crash report. Aileron's on the ground. Wingtip is- We just turned this Spitfire into the clipped wing model is all. Is it alright? No. Damn. It might be. Oops. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Tell the, the drone, not to me. <laughs> oh jeez. Alright, we got a lot of shit to break down here, so why don't we just start at the very beginning, the takeoff. This takeoff was absolute garbage. In propeller-driven aircraft, there's this little thing that we like to call a left-turning tendency. What happens is as the propeller comes down in a clockwise motion, the blade that is descending is creating more thrust than the blade that's coming up due to its angle of attack. This creates a left-turning motion or a yawing motion. As you can see in this clip, as soon as the tailwheel came up off the ground, the plane veered to the left. This is because I didn't have that tailwheel in contact with the pavement helping me maintain directional control. So as soon as that tailwheel came up, I didn't have enough right rudder into account of that tendency, and it veered straight into the dirt. I was lucky enough to be able to get it kind of under control, apply a little bit more power, and was able to take off before she went into the dirt. But that was a terrible takeoff. All right, we've definitely got to break this next section down, that part where I just about cratered the plane. What had happened is I came up for a nice drone shot, I slammed the power in, that left-turning tendency that we just talked about caused that nose to really swing around, and I was just barely able to pull up. You can see in these clips, like especially this one, that my right wing tip came with, within an inch to the ground. You could hear it in the pits hitting the grass. What's really fun is if you go frame by frame, you can see grass flying everywhere, which means that we turned this Spitfire into a goddamn lawnmower. I am so lucky that this plane came back. Everybody in the pits that saw this, their buttholes just went... All right, now this is the part that I was looking forward to breaking down the most, the drone collision. And if you go frame by frame, it tells a pretty fun little story. So in the frames leading up to the drone collision, we've got the Spitfire lining up for a beautiful drone shot, just freight training through the sky, which is all fun and games until it freight trains right into the DJI Mavic 3. After this frame, this one's probably my favorite. We just have the left wing tip flying into low Earth orbit. Continuing into the next frame, we get a nice side view of the Spitfire continuing. It's like, I don't give a shit if I lost my wingtip. This is what I was designed to do. After that, the rest is history. The drone fell out of the sky like a homesick brick. There's also this fun little clip that we captured with the tail camera on this airplane that happened so fast in the clips that we watched before that you probably didn't even notice it. You can see the plane flying through the air, kind of approaching the drone, and then one second, the left wing tip is there, and then the next one, it's just completely gone. This plane did not fly that great after the wingtip was missing, which is a little surprising to me. Initially, I thought that I had taken damage to the aileron. We did get it on the ground safely. At first, when I approached the plane, I saw the aileron hanging on the ground, so I had assumed 
that the aileron was completely trashed through the rest of the flight. But in watching this tail cam footage, I can see that the aileron actually stayed on the aircraft until it touched down and there was no air resistance. And then the aileron just kind of like, it just kind of fell off the plane. So at least the plane came back in one piece. That's more than I can say for some of my other ones. Well guys, I think that is a wrap on this video. The Spitfire should be adequately named the Drone Eater at this point. Overall, it was a total pain in the ass to put this plane together, but it flies beautifully, it looks beautiful, it eats drones for breakfast, literally. If you want to see me eat some more drones, or I don't know, fly some more 3D printed planes, leave a comment what you'd like to see me print and fly. Until next time, I guess just look out for drones. I, I don't know. <laughs>